What's up guys, welcome back to Destiny Updates. Today we've got a few interesting tidbits of news from a new article on official PlayStation Magazine UK. Most of it is stuff we already know, but there's still a few new things that are worth going over. So to start off, when discussing the world of Destiny, Christopher Barrett explains, It's a haunting sci-fi vision. The Cosmochrome Breach, frozen in time before the collapse. Ruins on the edge of the European dead zone with a perpetual dark storm looming above. The swamps of old Chicago. What was once a 12-story window in a skyscraper is now a doorway to a dungeon buried deep beneath the snow. Further afield in space, there are eerily abandoned moon bases, lost cities on Mars, mile-long tomb ships floating through space, and Barrett's favorite, giant obsidian pyramid ships. Now the reason that's interesting, even though it's mostly information we already know, is because it stresses this eerie, dark, haunting sci-fi vision, which we don't really hear much about. Bungie usually only puts emphasis on the bright and hopeful aspect. And I think that's definitely a good thing, that they're going into that dark, haunting side of it a bit. I mean, I want the world of Destiny to be a sort of pretty, bright, hopeful place that I want to explore and protect, but I think it's important to have that dark, dangerous side of it as well. Moving on, it talks about the various enemies in Destiny. Most of this we already know, but it does mention planet-crushing war beasts. Whether that's a new enemy or just a nickname for one of the currently known ones, I'm really not sure, although I probably lean more towards just a nickname. They also mention Charlemagne again, which we've heard of before, but this time it says that Charlemagne is a vast machine intelligence. So basically an AI, which I don't think we knew before. Next up is a little story we've heard a million times, the one where Jason Jones and Joseph Staten go on a mission to Mars together. But somehow, every time we hear it, we get a new piece of it that we didn't previously know. I swear these big media outlets just can't get it right. Anyways, it says, Staten describes how a typical mission plays out with these guys. Hopping into a spacecraft with his buddy, he heads out to the ruins in daytime, knowing that the Cabal will be out in smaller numbers than his last nighttime excursion. Suddenly, a Cabal dropship swoops in over the skyscrapers, unloads over our whole position with rockets, and drops a whole squad of Legionnaires backed up by a Centurion. It's not looking good, and for a second I wonder if we're even going to live long enough to make it through the front door. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff in that first paragraph, so let's take a closer look. First, they mention venturing into the ruins in daytime, because there would be less Cabal than there is at night. So that means that time of day has a much bigger role in Destiny than just aesthetics. It actually affects how missions will play out, and might make you want to be more careful about when you attempt certain missions. It also makes it sound like the Cabal might be more nocturnal, and not like coming out during the day. Now a big question I have is how this is going to work on different planets, because the different planets in our solar system have vastly different day-night cycles. I imagine we'll have some sort of system that informs us of the time on other planets and helps us calculate that out. Second, it says a Cabal dropship swoops over the skyscrapers and unloads over our position with rockets. So that means the Cabal have some form of dropship, and that will probably be a common form of transportation for them. I guess them being a space-going race means you should probably take a flying dropship for granted, but for some reason I never would have thought the Cabal would fly in with a dropship. They just seem so monstrous I always imagined them staying on the ground. And then the final one, it says they dropped a squad of Legionnaires backed up by a Centurion. That makes it sound like the Centurion is the higher ranked, more powerful one of the two classes we know of. Anyways, onto the next paragraph, it talks about the shared world aspect and how a random stranger stepped in to save them. It says, She showed up out of nowhere, carving sand on a stolen pike, strafing Cabal with her dual shock cannons. So that sounds like confirmation that the pike will have guns, and I mean it already looked like it had guns, but now it's more solid proof. Going on, it says after they made pork chops out of the Cabal, they grabbed Charlemagne and some loot and then went separate ways. So that brings up the common question, will everyone in your group be able to grab the same items? I mean, will all of them get to take a copy of Charlemagne home for their mission? I'm gonna guess yes. In a game like Destiny, I think everyone will have access to the same items, except perhaps some things that might be class specific. Moving on, it mentions classes and an interesting point comes up about the Warlock's powers. It says, when the Warlock uses their magical ability, it feels like punching someone in the face with a piece of the sun. So I'm really not sure what that's supposed to mean, but it certainly sounds interesting. It then says, everyone starts as a human guardian, blessed with a fragment of the Traveler's power. Now if you didn't already notice, there's a major, major flaw there. It says, everyone starts as a human guardian, which is completely untrue. We know for a fact we can choose between human, exo, and awoken. Honestly, it's kind of pathetic how inconsistent these media outlets can be, and it really annoys me. I mean, who knows what else might be inaccurate. Going on, it mainly talks about the shared world aspect, all stuff we already know, but it does mention how they want each player to feel special and unique, and not overshadowed by higher level players. Activision CEO Eric Hirschberg says, They might get in your way sometimes, and team up with you at other times, but the world is always shared and inhabited by other players. 
So anyways, it's nice to know that we'll still be able to feel like we're special and achieving something, even in the presence of high level players. Moving on, they talk about how it's really sounding like an MMO, and ask the question, why are they distancing themselves from the genre? Saying that it mostly has to do with subscription fees. Eric Hirschberg says, I know the words persistent world sometimes come with the assumption of a certain business model. And I want to just address this up front and rip this bandaid off right away. We have absolutely no plans to charge a subscription fee for Destiny. It's a boxed copy console release with a gun pointed into the horizon. So the article makes it sound like they're distancing themselves from the name MMO just because they don't want people to think it'll have a subscription fee. Which to be honest is absurd, not all MMOs have subscription fees. If that's the genre it belongs in, then that's what you name it. You don't give it a whole new genre name just because of that. The thing is though, like I said, I honestly don't know how accurate all of this is. I mean, I'm sure the quotes are accurate, but a lot of the other stuff is just the way the author perceived it and may not really mean much. Honestly, whether or not it really is an MMO is probably my biggest question right now and I kind of wish they'd stop toying with us. Just tell me how many players it supports on screen. Oh well, hopefully we'll find out more at E3. Now one thing I just noticed here is that Eric Hirschberg specifically says that it's a box copy console release. Now that sounds kind of bad for the chances of a PC release, which is both sad and really, really stupid on their part. There's no valid reason why Destiny shouldn't come to PC, and I hope it's not true, we don't know for sure yet, but it definitely doesn't sound too good. Now onto the last one, it talks about the tech for Destiny, with senior graphic designer Hao Chen saying, Over the last four years, we've built a truly state-of-the-art engine. It's by design multi-platform. It's highly multi-threaded, scales very well to the current generation and the future generation of hardware. We have a ton of new features, from our multi-resolution terrain systems, to our forests and trees, to rivers, to real-time lighting, visibility, lots of cool technology. So that sounds good, although there's not really a whole lot for me to add there because I don't fully understand the tech side of things. Continuing on, it talks a bunch more about the tech and tool set for Destiny, but there's not really a whole lot there that's new or worth repeating. So there you go, that's everything new and or interesting in the article. Once again, this is from Official PlayStation Magazine UK. Now here's an interesting thing real quick before we wrap this up. Apparently all of this info is still coming from Bungie's initial press event way back in February. And Urk from Bungie also said that most of the info that's scattered throughout the mail sacks is also from that old press event. It's just stuff that the media never published. How is it that with the countless articles we've read about that old event, three months down the road there's still stuff they missed or decided not to publish? I just don't understand the media. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed. Lots of work went into this one, so if you did, leaving a like would mean a lot. It helps support the channel and get the news out there, so I really appreciate it. So that's it for this video, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next update.